Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. Today we're gonna to talk about the personality type in the genius system, authenticity exploration, or in the Myers-Briggs system, the INFP personality. And uh, we've had a lot of INFPs requesting that we talk about this, and so we're going to deliver today and unpack this personality type. Yeah, what's so fascinating about this is we did an, a podcast dedicated to the INFJ personality type a, a few months ago and had really good response. Uh, it went, I mean, for within our definition, it went viral. <laughs> I don't know if it technically went viral, but it seems to be something that a lot of people find Personality Hacker through is that particular podcast. And then right after that podcast, we got a lot of requests for an INTJ podcast. And I actually ended up writing an article on INTJs, which again, went in our definition viral, right? quite a few shares. People had a really good response. One of the things I said in that article, though, is I said that INJs in general, INTJs and INFJs, may be the most misunderstood types. And INFPs took umbrage with that. <laughs> I got a lot of emails, comments. I got a lot of feedback from INFPs that were like, hey, what about us? We feel really misunderstood, too. And so it I was, you know, I, I was in the middle of writing an article about this and we talked about doing a podcast, but there was like a piece of information missing for me. And there was a piece of information missing about why I would assert, like in my own mind, why I would assert that INJs are m maybe more misunderstood than say INFPs who could feel very misunderstood. And so I, I over time, you know, we, you and I talked to quite a few INFPs about this. We had lots of conversations between the two of us to try to nail down what's going on here. And I think we got it. I think we kind we finally figured out what that weird little in-between world is of INFJs being misunderstood or INJs being misunderstood and INFPs feeling misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And I think we figured it out. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm actually in the Myers-Briggs system. I'm an ENFP. So I'm an NFP. I'm similar in type to an INFP, but I am obviously different. And as I was reading the comments from INFPs saying they feel, felt fundamentally misunderstood, I kind of, because I'm an NFP, I kind of got what they were saying, but I also said there's something here, I, I think they're using this word misunderstood in a way to describe something else that's going on for them. And I don't think it's actually feeling misunderstood is, is what we kind of came down to. And it's through these discussions, through some of our conversations with the INFPs, you're exactly right. It, something felt off about it. And so we're going to posit some ideas today on what our take is on this and what we actually think is going on. And if you're an INFP listening, let us know what, how you're resonating with this. Let us know if you think we're getting close to what it is that's actually happening for you besides this idea, this precise definition of being misunderstood. Really what it comes down to is, is it a problem? whether or not you're misunderstood. That's really what we're talking about. It's not whether or not INFPs feel misunderstood. They probably do. The question is, is it actually an issue? Is it a problem whether or not INFPs feel misunderstood? And that's the distinction that we really want to head toward. So a little bit of review before we get into this, just about the INFP personality in the Myers-Briggs system or the authenticity exploration personality in the genius system. Understand that if you've looked at some of the ways that, per, that Personality Hacker looks at the INFP personality or any personality, we have what we call a car model. And we've broken down your personality into what's the technical definition is cognitive functions. And this is a Myers-Briggs thing, the cognitive functions. But we've, we've given them some nicknames to make them a little bit more palatable and easy to understand for people that are maybe new to the system, make it more accessible. And so if you're looking at uh, your car model as an INFP, you're going to lead with a process that we've nicknamed authenticity. Now, to break it down, just to give a little technical definition before you go launch into the full car model, a cognitive function is a mental process that helps you either learn new information or make decisions. So the, the four-letter code of INFP is actually, think of it as a decoder ring to tell you what how your brain is wired, basically. It's it's not meant to be the full description. It's meant to give you a, a, an entrance into these mental processes 
that describe how you learn new information and how you make decisions based on that information. So when we mention cognitive functions or mental processes or the car model, what we're really referencing is how your brain is fundamentally wired. Now your identity, your the rest of your personality, your interests, your values, you know, family influences, all these things are, think of them as programming that is written on top of this wiring. So those are not what we're really describing. We're not talking about all the components of who you are as an individual. We're just really focusing on how your brain is wired. And that's what we mean by the car model. The car model is a, a, is a metaphor for breaking down these components of your brain wiring. Absolutely. Thank you for, for clarifying that. And so what we're going to describe here, what I'm going to describe here with this idea of this car model, these, again, these aren't, like Antonia just said, they're not necessarily going to describe your behavior. Behavior is going to emerge from this. So these are how your mind is processing. It's, this is how your mind is learning information. And this is how your mind is making decisions. And as an INFP, the INFP is, again, a short code for how your mind is actually functioning and how it's working. The primary process that your mind works with is this nickname we've called authenticity. Now, the technical definition of this is introverted feeling. So if you're a Myers-Briggs geek or you've gone into some cognitive function study, the technical definition you're going to see written other places is going to be introverted feeling, and it's oftentimes written in shorthand as FI, capital F, a little I, just for you know the sake of technical abilities here. But for the sake of this conversation, we're going to call it authenticity, which is the nickname we've given it. And authenticity is a way that you, as an INFP, make your decisions. So the primary way that you interact with the world is through a decision-making process that we've nicknamed authenticity. And it's about things that really resonate with you at an identity level. Is it in alignment with you as your core values? Is it in alignment with you of how you feel about something? You're going through life and you're making your decisions based on what feels right to you. If something feels right, if it feels to the core of your being, like this is the right course of action, you're going to take action toward that thing. If it feels wrong, you're probably not going to take action toward that thing. And oftentimes you can still take the action and it just feels terrible. And you'll you'll know that because your heart is just, uh, it just doesn't feel right to you. And so that's the process that you're going through the world using is this authenticity process of does this action, does this thing feel right to me? personally, at a gut level, at a core value, internal alignment level. The authenticity process is very introspective. Always registering how things make an individual feel. Well, over time, if you are constantly registering how something's making you feel, it makes sense that you're going to become a master of how how things make people feel in general, right? Because you're going to start mapping those emotions. In fact, for INFPs, one of the things that is just absolutely beautiful in their ability to understand themselves is how intricately and how nuanced they have mapped their emotions inside of themselves, right? They understand emotions on an extraordinarily nuanced level. Now, obviously, you're also going to take into account why things make you feel the way they do, right? Like not just what, but eventually becomes why. Why am I feeling the way that I'm feeling about these things? What determines a good or bad action? What determines an ethical or moral action? Because certain things make me feel certain ways. And then the exact same action or behavior of someone in a different context can make me feel a completely different way, right? One made me feel good and the other made me feel bad. So if it was the same action that the person took, but the context was different, then is that action good or bad? Because it made me feel different, right? It made me feel good in one context and bad in another context. So now a lot of ethical implications start coming up. It's not just introspective at that point. It's not just, oh, I feel good here and feel bad there. It's also saying, huh, it's really interesting to me that different actions can evoke different emotions or the exact same action can evoke two different emotions depending upon the context. So questions of ethics become very intriguing to INFPs, right? Like what's the pattern of what's going on here? What's the pattern of why people's behavior make individuals feel differently? authenticity is very in touch with the subjective human experience Mm. and so i'm feeling a certain way about this thing and over time the i feel a certain way about this thing becomes i think people in general feel 
a certain way about these things, right? Like, I, I think this is probably not just me. I think this extremely personal, subjective human experience, I think this is probably shared, in fact, by everyone, right? I think this is universal. And so there ends up becoming this sense of simpatico with other human beings. I feel this way. I bet that other person feels this way too. And so there's this sort of overarching meta concept of emotions that ends up becoming, I mean, you become, an INFP becomes very, they become a master of understanding the subjective human experience in general because they've mastered it for themselves. And then at some point they go, I don't think this is just me. I think this is everybody. And so now they've mastered the subjective human experience in general. I think I would just add to that, that that ability to determine that something resonates with you to the degree that it probably also resonates with someone else is a maturity of that authenticity process and a mature authenticity person, whether you're an INFP, an ENFP, ESFP, ISFP, if you have one of your authenticity, either as your driver or co-pilot, and we'll get into that in a minute here, but understanding that difference between, particularly for the INFP, the difference between something that's subjective just for you and something that's subjective for you and probably is also something that other people deal with it as well is one of the the ways you can see the maturity of authenticity growing. So what I mean by that is it's oftentimes you can confuse. I can confuse my subjective subjective experience with other people's experience as well. And being able to determine which is just for me, this is just my subjective, or this is subjective enough for me that I can probably pattern it onto other people is a way that you can really tell a mature authenticity person. Does that is that resonate? Is that making sense? I just want to make sure that was clear because there is something to be said for going off the rails and thinking, well, this is this is how I resonate with it. So of course, everybody else resonate, resonates this way as well. So basically what you're saying is that when you really master this authenticity process, you're able to figure out whether or not something is hitting you just unique based on you. Yes. Or whether or not this is hitting you a certain way and it's probably going to hit other people the same way. Yes. There's like a distinction there between just the individuality versus the personal universal. And the more mature you are, the more you'll understand the difference between that. And I mean, obviously, it's part of my growth is understanding these differences. So Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just pausing that out to say that I've seen you know, younger, maybe INFPs that don't, they don't have that clearly dialed in yet. And so they assume that their subjective experience is what other people are experiencing. Mm -hmm. And that may not be, that may not be a total mature view of it yet. And you'll grow into it over time, but it is a skill you develop of being able to see that in other people, just because it's your own subjective experience doesn't mean other people are going to experience it that way. However, you're probably going to be getting good at this as you grow older and as you mature in your life. Uh, To add to that, not to spend too much time on what immature authenticity looks like, but I think it's worth noting, right, uh, what it can look like when it's, you know, immature versus mature. I think the other side of that is I'm experiencing something so unique nobody could possibly ever understand it, right? Like, that's where I think you get this stereotype of, say, maybe the teenager who's an INFP who goes totally emo, right? Like, closes themselves off in their room, cloisters themselves off in the room and wears only black and listens to like, you know, the cure on loop. That's exactly how I was thinking of the cure, the same thing. <laughs> right. So it's like this idea that nobody could possibly understand what I'm going through, right? Like as if the teenage experience isn't completely universal. But there's this idea that only I experience my own personal suffering, which is true to some extent. And also there is you know, there's similarities in how people experience things. So I, I do think you're right. I think over time, authenticity as it matures, understands first that not everybody's experiencing everything exactly as they are. And also, other people can resonate with how you feel. That there is some sense of universality with some of these emotions. And it's not just completely 100%, nobody could ever understand your pain. However, that is a great segue into what we were talking about before, which is do INFPs want to be fully understood? Is it a problem if they're not completely understood? And I think the answer to that is found within this process of authenticity. Because introverted feeling or authenticity is so in touch with how it's feeling in such an extraordinarily granular, nuanced way, The reality is, is nobody can truly understand them. 
nobody can fully 100% understand you because nobody's living inside of the space that you're occupying. Nobody's inside of you. So nobody could possibly truly 100% understand you completely. And I think INFPs more than anybody know that. I think they really truly understand that nobody could 100% fully grasp what it means to be them as an individual. And to some degree, that's a lonely place to be. You feel like I have so much nuance in how I feel about things that there is no possible way I can be fully understood. And I feel, I feel misunderstood because I have so much nuance in how I feel about all these things in life. And I'm sure no one else, because they're so, they're so precise, my feelings are so precise, they're so nuanced, it would be impossible for anyone else to replicate those emotions to the degree that they'd be able to understand how I'm feeling about this. I feel a little bit isolated, lonely, and, and quote unquote misunderstood in how I'm showing up in the world. And I think there is validity to, as an INFP, if you're listening, I think there's validity to you saying, hey, I feel misunderstood. I feel like no one's ever going to fully understand me, to echo what you just said, Antonia, that it's because of this. It's because it's so granular. It's so nuanced. It's so detailed. And you probably don't even have language for this stuff. If you're an INFP, you just know it. You just feel it in your heart. You you know, you might not have language for these nuanced emotions of love, but you might have like six million versions of love in your heart. And each one means something different to you. You couldn't even articulate it out loud, but you know it in your heart. You can feel it. You can map it somewhat internally. And there'd be no way for someone to get the fidelity of replicating that emotion to be able to understand that, you know, combination of these thoughts and feelings you have going on inside. I think, though, after talking to a lot of INFPs, actually, after talking to a lot of authenticity users in general, like you said, there's four different Myers-Briggs types that use authenticity. And my observation has been after talking to a lot of them. Now, I'm an ENTP, so... I mean, I'm only I'm only looking at this stuff from the outside, right? I'm never going to occupy that space. But my observation has been that if an authenticity person, right, in particular an IFP, but we're talking about INFPs right now, if an INFP thought that somebody truly 100% understood them to the core of their being, I think that they would almost feel really disconcerted by that because it would mean that they didn't have that individuality, it would mean that they didn't have all of those nuanced, granular distinctions between how they feel. They would probably just feel it was presumptive. Presumptive because technically by definition it is impossible. And I think the INFP understands this. And this, this comes all the way back to the very thing we talked about, about this feeling of misunderstanding. So if you have so much nuance to your emotion that, that there's granular distinction there and you can't even articulate it to share it with somebody else because it's just all in your heart. You know it to the degree so deeply in your own impersonal, like inside part of you that you say, I feel misunderstood. The, the thing that you realize as an INFP, as an NFP in general, is that no one will ever be able to understand you fully, like we've talked about. And so it really comes down to, I can't, I, I can't articulate out loud to you enough of the nuance of my heart to be understood. So therefore, I feel misunderstood. And it, and it looks like the, the INFP is looking for understanding at that point. And this comes back to what we're going to talk about here is our, our theory on this, our thoughts on this, is that the INFP is not looking for understanding because they know at the core of their being that's impossible. Not 100% understanding. Not 100% understanding. Yeah. What they're actually looking for is because they're bringing their heart to the, to the world is... I know, I understand you can't I un, I know you can't fully understand me but will you at least validate the emotions I'm bringing to the world? Mm -hmm. Will you at least validate that I have legitimate nuanced granular distinct emotions that I feel deep in the core of my heart that I know can never be fully understood? So can you just trust that I've got good intent? that I'm a good person and that you can validate the fact that I'm showing up as the best version of myself and not question that all the time because I may not have language to articulate how I'm showing up. And I know I can't really get it to where you fully understand me, but please validate that I'm showing up as a good person and I've got good intent. Yeah, I, I think that's so, I think that's so important. I think also because authenticity is a decision-making process in that, of all of the, you know, there's eight cognitive functions. 
And four of them are what we call learning processes or functions, and four of them are decision making. And the four that are decision making, you've got, I mean, we, we, we call them effectiveness, accuracy, harmony, and authenticity. Effectiveness is all about what works in the outside world, right? It's, it's what thinker judges or TJs in the Myers-Briggs system use. It's all about what works. Here, I can prove it to you. Let me show you the numbers. Let me show the metrics. Let me prove it with like, look, you know, it's, we got the goal accomplished. It works, right? So effectiveness is very easy to quote unquote prove. Now, you might argue whether or not the thing was effective to get our goals accomplished. But fundamentally, there's like, you know, there's charts, graphs that, that an effectiveness person can point to and go, look, see, it works. Harmony is what gets everybody's needs met, right? Harmony is what like uh, FJs in the Myers-Briggs system use. Well, you can point to whether or not people are getting their needs met, right? Because you have a feedback system of grumpiness or happiness. <laughs> when people get their needs met, they feel good. And when they don't, they feel grumpy. So harmony, you can fundamentally point to and go, see, look, people are feeling good, right? I got my goal accomplished. Well, even beyond just the feeling, you, their belly is full or empty. I mean, literally, there's physical markers too. Yeah. For accuracy, now accuracy is what the thinker perceivers in the Myers-Briggs system use, TPs. And accuracy is a little less, you know, it's, it's, a, it's something that's also subjective, like authenticity is. However, accuracy comes down to what makes logical, analytical sense. And one of the things that thinker perceivers or auth- accuracy people really get good at is arguing their point. <laughs> they get really good at pointing out logical inconsistencies and incongruities and helping people understand why they got to the logical point that they did. I mean, it's almost like math. It's like one point. One plus one equals two, right? Let me, that's a theor, you know, that's a theoretical concept, but let me explain why it makes logistical or analytical sense. So even accuracy people have an easier time of quote unquote proving their point. Authenticity though comes down to what feels right to me. So we're talking about fully subjective and not something you can really argue. You can't go, look, here are the data points of my emotions, <laughs> right? Like when an authenticity person makes a decision, when they when they evaluate something as a as good or bad or as a should, should not statement, they're talking about their subjective human emotional experience. What feels in alignment for me? And that's not something that other types necessarily honor, right? In fact, they almost always go, we'll prove it, right? And that's what we do to each other. No matter what our, t- our personality type is, if somebody is not representing our evaluation criteria, we want them to prove their point. We want them to show us why we should honor their decision-making over our decision-making. That's just naturally how we do it because we're going to be looking at different stuff. For an authenticity person, when they get challenged, it's so difficult for them to explain how they know what they know. It's so difficult for them to explain why it's valid because it has to do with how they feel about it, which most other types don't really honor, right? Don't respect. So that need to feel validated isn't necessarily just saying, oh, yeah, you're right. It's a need to validate how they go about making decisions. Oh, I'm sorry to cut you off. I can't. I can't resonate with what you're saying more because as an ENFP, I use authenticity as my co-pilot. And it's so frustrating. I mean, even you and I could be in a disagreement. And I have a point I want to make or a, a position I have. And it's so frustrating because you can logically spell out why you believe something or why you think something should be a certain way. And sometimes mine just comes down to, I just, I don't feel like that's the right course of action. And you're like, why? Or somebody else might be like, why? I don't know. Can you just validate the fact that I'm coming to you and I have an internal mechanism that I believe is is good. It's not going to lead us astray. I just don't feel like this is right. I can't give you data points. And it's maddening as an, as an authenticity person to be in that frame and you feel so frustrated because other people want that external reasoning or realization of why something should be the, the way it is. Mm-hmm. So when you, when you really look at what's going on for NFPs, and particularly right now we're talking about INFPs, it's not that an INFP wants to feel 100% understood because I don't think that they think they could anyway, right? Like I... I don't think an INFP would ever believe that anybody else could truly understand them. Or maybe they don't even want to. And they probably would not want that if they could have it, (laughs) right? Because then that would mean that they didn't have that world that they had mastered internally that it's only for them. I do believe, though, that INFPs are thirsty for validation. When they say they feel misunderstood, I think what they're actually saying is, I feel invalidated, I don't think other people are taking me seriously. 
I don't think other people are honoring my process. I think that's really what it comes down to. So when they say, oh, I just like they, you're just not understanding me. They're right. The other person isn't understanding how the authenticity process works, but it's not understanding who they are, you know, as a person. It's understanding how their process works. And that's maddening. It's got to be so frustrating for anybody using authenticity, but particularly an INFP who is who's like trying to express something that they have mastery over. If you've been using your driver process, that driver process of authenticity for an INFP, you have mastery over it, okay? You've clocked way more than 10,000 hours using this, and there is wisdom inside of that authenticity process. But if you cannot articulate it, if you cannot, if if somebody's got to learn this about you over time, that's got to be so frustrating. Yeah, I I would say my perspective would be, and I want to hear feedback from the INFP listening. If you're listening, you're an INFP, you're listening. I want to hear feedback from you because... I believe it is the feeling of being marginalized and dismissed more than being misunderstood is what my perspective would be. This is what I would posit. And I want to hear back. Maybe it is being misunderstood, but I I fundamentally believe it is the feeling of being marginalized and dismissed way more than being misunderstood. And that is so disheartening because as a as an NFP, as someone that comes with authenticity, I understand that that feels so horrible. Now I've got other strategies I try to deal with it. I'm not I'm not authenticity primary. I'm not an INFP, but I can imagine that the feelings I feel is not even an authenticity driver. Is not an authenticity somebody that leads with this process. I can imagine how much more distressful and disheartening this can be for you as an INFP listening than it could be even for me. And I already have some of this I deal with. So. Let me know your feedback on this. Let us know your feedback on this because this is something that we feel would be a leverage point for helping you grow to understand this about yourself and and to have some language around to help explain some of the things you're going through to other people that may not be your type that you're interacting with in the world. Yeah, because the authenticity process, I mean, I, I guess for other types, it would be really easy to, in fact, I've, I've actually seen other personality types talk about introverted feeling or authenticity process as being, you know, like really annoying (laughs) somehow. And every time I see that, I think, yeah, but if we, if we didn't have that, let's say we have seven cognitive functions and not eight, and we pull the authenticity process out of the mix, suddenly we have a world without conscience. I personally believe that authenticity is where we as human beings find our conscience, because that's where we ask, what is a good or bad action to take? How are we going to impact, you know, not just me, but everybody on a subjective human experience? How do we honor that? How do we honor people's individuality and what is meaningful to them and how things are making them feel on a profound individual level? You remove that component, suddenly you have a world without conscience. You've got a bunch of sociopaths. So I think really... Or, or Washington, D.C. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think really... As, a, as an ENTP, honoring authenticity and understanding how important it is has been a big growth for me, right? Like this idea of like, oh, it doesn't make you feel good. Well, pick yourself up by your bootstraps and keep going. No, maybe it doesn't make you feel good because you instinctively know that this is a bad thing to do, right? Like the wrong thing to do. Like it will impact people in a negative way on a large scale. And you can't maybe explain exactly how you know that, but you know that, these things should totally be honored by other people. And if they aren't, if you're being, like you said, marginalized for your, you know, your decision-making process, it's got to be frustrating. I've noticed, though, this is not just a, I mean, we want to acknowledge that we have sympathy for the pain that people of this type can go through. Just like with INFJs, I think one of the reasons why INFPs and INFJs have a tendency to mistype as each other is I do believe that these two types, these two INF types, have very peculiar pain that they deal with in life. And I think there's some crossover in how the pain shows up for them. I think it comes from different roots, but I do think that there is pain that they both experience. And that should be acknowledged. I think it should be acknowledged that INFPs are going to experience a very specific kind of pain for their personality type. That said, I don't think that they're martyrs and I don't think that they're without resource. INFPs, they figure out a couple strategies that is very powerful (laughs) for dealing with the world, especially a world that can marginalize them. And I kind of want to mention, or at least I want to go down the road of talking about some of the things that they're extremely good at. 
some of the ways, some of the markers for how they get through life and some of the things that they're just really spectacular, like better than any other type at. Just before we go down that road, I want to just flesh out the frame of the personality type itself oh, yeah. very quickly. Sure. That Because we started talking about using the car model that Personality Hacker uses. The authenticity part is your driver. And that's really your flow state. That's where you have spent time clocking those 10,000 hours we talk about. You balance that with a perceiving process or a learning process that we've nicknamed exploration. The technical name of that is extroverted intuition. So if you're following along on the technical definitions. And exploration is about advanced pattern recognition in the outside world. So it's about perceiving things, seeing what's behind the curtain, being able to ask what if questions, possibility thinking, outside the box thinking, behind the curtain thinking. These are all metaphors for what's going on here. But what's actually happening is your mind is taking a few pieces of information, almost in real time, in the external world, and you're making you're making connections that aren't necessarily there by definition. And you're getting really good at this. This is a talent of yours. It's not as it's not as much of a talent as your authenticity process, but it is a talent of yours. And it is the place where we have put emphasis, the secondary position, this auxiliary function, as it's technically called, or the co-pilot function, which is this exploration function for an INFP, is what we've determined is the growth position for you. It's pl- the place where you can grow as a person using this as the lens to do personal growth and personal development. So I just wanted to put that out as a framework as the personality type itself, just to know that that authenticity part is also being balanced by a learning piece of you, which is using exploration, our nickname, exploration, to learn as you go through life. And if you want more description or definition around the exploration process, we did a podcast called introverted intuition versus extroverted intuition, which we recommend you reference if you want more description on that. What's great, though, is that when you couple these two processes of authenticity and exploration, because you're seeing everything through the lens of the subjective human experience, this is how you eventually understand that you're not the only person who's experiencing this. When you couple it with exploration, that means you're looking at other people and you start you pattern recognize that they're going through something similar to you. And this is how you this is how you understand that there's a bigger thing going on here. This is also where you take cues on how other people are responding to a situation just like how you're responding, right? Like a situation evokes a response. The first thing you register is how it's making you feel. Then you look up and you notice all these little subtle cues of other people in the group and how they're experiencing the situation. And then you can pattern recognize what they're going through. What's the specific emotion they're feeling? And because you've gotten so good at mapping emotions, mapping how emotions work inside of you, it takes really, really little, tiny little cues that the other person is putting off in order for you to go, yeah, I think that's what they're feeling too. Or that person's feeling something slightly different than me. They're feeling this thing instead. So it's coupling this uh, this introspective ability to understand what's happening for you on a very personal level. It's coupling that with the ability to understand what's going on for other people too. Because they're giving you all sorts of tells that indicate what's happening inside their heart. And I want to contrast that to the podcast we did on the INFJ personality, which is using a process that we've nicknamed Harmony, which is extroverted feeling, which is picking up emotions almost through the air like an antenna. The the authenticity and exploration process combined looks a little different. It exhibits some of the same type of reading ability. So you're able to see emotions and pick up emotions but it's doing it a little bit differently than the INFJ. And we can unpack that a little bit as we go, but I just want to posit that as well because we have a lot of INFJ listeners. And if you're an INFJ listening, this is just a little nuance here of how these things are working. The picking up of other people's emotions might look the same in the, in the, the, the interpretation of those emotions, but how you're doing it is different. Yeah, it's and it's, oh man, it, it really confuses people that are trying to determine their type between INFJ and INFP. We actually wrote an article on the blog about the difference between INFJs and INFPs. So if you want a more zoomed in or deep dive explanation of how these different processes work, you know, underneath the surface, not just how they manifest, but how they work underneath the surface, I recommend referencing that article. And then you can see how, you know, the different quote unquote passengers in the car or these cognitive functions between INFJs and INFPs work and how they're, they look similar, but they're actually working very differently. That said, 
as an INFP, it's really important to remember that you do have a superpower in this. This is something that you're spectacularly good, um, good at. And that's, I'm so glad that you wanted to make sure that we completed that visual because I want to talk about something that INFPs are spectacularly good at. They've, I mean, they got, they've gotten me a couple times, <laughs> like in a way that's very disconcerting to me, how they work their mojo on me. And that is what I call emotional Aikido. Now, Aikido is a martial art technique where you don't actually go on the offensive. What you do is you move the energy around that the other person is utilizing and you work it in your favor, right? Like they come and attack you, they go to swing at you and you just subtly move the energy of how they were swinging at you and you use it against the other person, right? And this is, uh, it's an entire martial arts discipline around moving these energies, these physical energies, so that you don't actually ever have to get hit. It almost looks like a dance. When somebody is putting off an emotion, they are so good at just suddenly changing, changing the energy of that emotion and having it have a completely different output. I think it's because they understand on such a fine tooth level the interaction between these emotions. They see how the emotions are so close to each other. All they have to do is just do a little tiny tweak, right? And all of a sudden now you've got a different emotion, right? Like there's just a little tweak. There's just a little difference between, you know, like frustration and relief, right? Like this person is feeling frustration, but I'm just gonna tweak it a little bit and suddenly they feel relief. So this emotional Aikido is just, I, I, I know that this has worked on me and I'm pretty savvy. I'm pretty good at knowing when somebody's manipulating me. And I I get had so often with INFPs. They can just alter my mo- like my mood just instantly. And I'm like, whoa, I was just angry. And now I'm not angry at all anymore. In fact, I'm feeling awesome. How did that happen? Now, I, I use the word manipulate. That doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing, right? Manipulation is anytime you, you know, you work with something in the outside world or even in your inner world to change it to something else. So I use manipulate. It could be, I mean, I use that as a neutral term. It can either be good or bad. Yeah, I would, I would call them emotional alchemists. They can turn any emotion into gold in some way if they're skilled at that and they've built skill around it. And, you know, for, for you that, you some of if you're listening and you're not an INFP, a real a real easy way to kind of understand this a little bit is, you know, there's this saying that the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. So if someone's feeling strong hate, it's very easy to switch that into love because they're they're very close to each other in a sense. Like these are gross, oversimplified emotions, just for people that aren't INFPs listening. And you can see how like, you know, two lovers are are fighting with each other, really upset, and all of a sudden, like a few minutes later, they could be like going and having sex because there's that passion there that was switched from like intense aggression to intense love and affection. And we see that like in movies and overgeneralizations of emotion. Just think about that now at like the nth degree nuance of like little, very, very precise emotions that INFPs are able to look at and just like Antonio said, just switch them from one thing to the other. And now the meaning of that emotion is completely different and the person feels completely different. And all it was was energy alchemy. It was like energy manipulation of turning something into something else, not fighting it, not resisting it, but pulling it in, working with it, turning it into something else and then letting it go really gently. And now that person's like, wow, I feel great or I feel different or and vice versa. It could be used for evil as well. You know, you feel great and they can move you into a manipulated emotion of feeling bad. Most people aren't going to do that. Most people have good intent and they want to help people feel good. But that's an ability, a superpower that an INFP would also have. Yeah, absolutely. This is, I think, a strategy that they utilize just to, I don't know, just to kind of get through the world. And and I think one of the reasons why INFPs build some of these strategies is because they I, they instinctively know that they're going through a world that isn't necessarily honoring them to their full ability. I, I think of, there's a great line in one of the Harry Potter movies where Dumbledore is talking to Harry and he says, he says, Harry, you have the characteristic of kindness, a characteristic that people never fail to underestimate, right? Or to take for granted. I think that's what he said. You have kindness, which is a characteristic that people never fail to take for granted. And, or maybe he didn't say that, but it was something like that. (laughs) It was either take for granted or underestimate or whatever. I think people never fail to underestimate INFPs. I really do believe that they have a tendency to underestimate them. And INFPs know that they're not, 
they are not the prototype that say the the country that we live in in America. Man, Americans just we leg hump effectiveness. <laughs> like we are so massively besotted with the decision making process of effectiveness, right? To a point where I think actually we harm ourselves. We hurt ourselves with in the process. The INFPs know that they're going to be marginalized in comparison. Americans are A types. We're always trying to get something done. We work 12 hour days because, you know, if we if we're good easy on ourselves, then that's somehow like self-indulgent. Oh, we just hate this concept of self-indulgence and we judge 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 anybody who's self-indulgent. And so effectiveness becomes our guiding star. And INFPs instinctively know that they don't fit into that mold. They don't fit into that, you know, sort of that prototype of what the the best American is supposed to look like. And there's probably some of this in other countries too, developed countries, I would imagine. At the same time, we all celebrate things like great artists and the arts and self-expression. So we have this really kind of I don't know, this bastardized bastardized relationship with authenticity, the authenticity process. And the reason why I actually mention art, we haven't really talked about this component, but art is one of the places where INFPs absolutely thrive. This is another strategy. Just like we marginalize in this country, we marginalize the authenticity process, we also have a massive love affair with what authenticity can, can create. And that is extraordinary art. Now, the reason why authenticity, and in particular INFPs, are so good with art is that art is one of the few places that we can articulate how we're feeling on a very fine grain level in a way that can be replicated to other people. That is where a lot of authenticity people feel true understanding. Understanding on a very simpatico level. I might not be able to articulate or explain to you in just co- conversation, communi- like basic standard communication conversation, how I'm feeling, but I can create a painting or a song or a novel, whatever it happens to be, that will put you so into that mode that you are experiencing your version of it, right? Like you can mirror the emotion inside of you. And that's what art does. Art is a, it, it's a communication of feeling. And so INFPs absolutely just flourish in this context because they are trying to feel a sense of simpatico. They're trying to get you to understand what's happening for humans in general. Sometimes it's their personal human experience. Maybe it's a human experience that they've observed from somebody else and they're trying to get you to understand it. And they will do that. They will they will create art that's so beautiful and so profound and so impactful that you are absolutely sobbing looking at this painting, right? Which is just a collaboration of color, right? Color on canvas. And you're crying looking at this painting. That's, that is one of the greatest strategies that authenticity has learned to use to really have an impact on the outer world. Yeah, I think it is. The authenticity process is an immersive, experiential process. And so in order to communicate effectively, immersively experiencing something is the way to do it for for an authenticity person you know that's 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 how they communicate that deep inner emotion is you've got experience you you actually kind of have to experience the emotion i'm experiencing for you to understand the emotion i can't articulate it to you with word you can try so i think about the movie boyhood we watched recently it was i think it was nominated for academy award best picture richard linkletter who i'm guessing is an infp most likely just based on the type of movies he makes. This movie was such a slice of life about this boy growing up. And there wasn't real any real plot to it. It was just really understanding his subjective human experience and watching him. And it was literally the same actor that started, you know, as a child. And then over 20 years, Richard Linkletter followed this kid. And every few years, he would film new scenes throughout his life and watching him actually grow up. And in the movies, also growing up. So it was a really interesting experience of seeing this immersive emotional impact this movie had on people watching it to say, oh, I'm getting the experience this kid had. There was no way you could describe the experience. You almost had to observe it and be a part of the experience with this kid to fully understand it. And I think that's really what authenticity does well is they throw you in a situation where you can experience an emotion. And I think that's why this art piece, writing, film, music, all of this comes out of that. It's immersive And it's experiential. That really reminds me of a component of authenticity. I think we've touched on this component, but we haven't really talked about what I would call mirroring. Now, again, I mean, 
it's it's hard not to talk about INFPs in contrast to say INFJs because they're so similar in type, and yet there's there's these nuanced differences that I think are the difference, you know, the differences that make the difference. For the harmony process, you mentioned for INFJs who use harmony, it's more about sort of absorption of emotion. It's like you're experiencing an emotion and I'm in your emotion, energetic proximity. So I'm picking up your emotional energy. Authenticity works a little different. It's more like I know I'm so in touch with how I would feel in this moment. And you're giving me tells about what you're going through. I'm going to recall, I'm going to unconsciously recall how I would feel or how I felt in the past in the same situation or similar situation or how I think I might feel. I imagine how I might feel if I was in, in your shoes. That Now I can mirror your emotion. That's different than absorbing. Absorbing an emotion means that your emotion is in me now, right? It's not mine authentically. I did not, this was not mine to begin with. It was yours and now I'm feeling it. That's more how INFJs experience this emotional simpatico. For INFPs, it's more like I'm so in touch with my emotional experience that if you give me even a couple different, da- you know, points, I call them data points because I'm a thinker, but if you give me just a couple little tells about what's going on for you, I can unconsciously and instantly replicate that emotion inside of me. How would I be feeling, right? And boom, it's I'm feeling it, right? I'm feeling how I would be feeling if I were you. So this ability to mirror an emotion, this ability to see what somebody else is, you know, what's happening for somebody else and to recall up or call up your emotional experience were you to be that person. It doesn't require you to be in the other person's energetic space. For an INFJ, it's it's real time. I'm here, you're here, I'm feeling what you're feeling. But for an INFP, because it's more a recalling of how the authenticity user or the INFP themselves would feel were they to be you, it doesn't require that energy exchange. It doesn't require that person to be in their physical vicinity in order to experience this mirroring of emotions. So it can be asynchronous. It doesn't have to be in real time. It can be over time, meaning that I can know what you were feeling 1500 years ago because I see some pottery that has some art on it, (laughs) right? That's been discovered in the ground. And I can know how you were living your life back then. So you can transfer this emotional language over extraordinarily long spans of time. And that's what art does. Art gives us a time capsule of somebody else's subjective human experience. So because authenticity people, and in particular INFPs, become masters of this, they also become masters of you experiencing what they were feeling. The the mirroring goes both directions. They master the emotional mirroring process. And that's where art comes in. I think that's where the Aikido comes in too, is this understanding of how to like get that person to feel something slightly different. How do I get them to mirror the emotion I want them to mirror? How do I mirror the emotion that they're they're experiencing? So I I can be in their space. I can get how they're feeling, right? I can tune in. I can tune into that emotional frequency. And then I can get them to feel something different. Yeah. I, I think of, as you said, that, that what came up for me is, and I'm again, I'm an authenticity co-pilot for me as an ENFP. But if I read out loud the poem, The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe, almost every time at the end of it, I can I'll usually be in tears. Like it's an emotional experience. It's asynchronous. This is written over 100 years ago. And I can actually replicate the emotion that Edgar Allan Poe was probably feeling as he was writing this poem just by reading it out loud to myself. And it can put me into an emotional state. Whereas another thing that authenticity can also do is turn off emotion in real time. You know, like that the INFJ you're talking about that picks up emotion, they can actually appear very cold and distant when someone's feeling really intense around them because they have to choose to replicate that emotion and you know and bring it up for themselves it's not chosen for them and if they choose not to they can appear like they're just shutting off emotion and they're cold and calculated and they're not feeling anything they're heartless i've been i've been called again i'm not an infp but i've been called you know ice water running through my veins or cold hearted or distant or disconnected from emotion before and i don't feel that way about myself at all and i'm guessing infps don't feel that way either but i bet they have similar experiences. If you're an INFP listening, you probably had a similar experience where you haven't allowed yourself to feel an emotion and people expect you to and you come off like you're cold and you just don't have any feelings or any any 
like sympathy. It's because you have the choice to feel it or not. You can replicate it back into yourself or not. You can mirror it or not. And it's dependent on you to decide when you're going to do that. And so that's an ability you have as well. And that same type of emotional Aikido that happens. Now, I want to say that, and this is going to lead us down the road of maybe talking about the darker aspects of INFP when I say this, which is where we need to go next anyway. Uh, Not that there's tons of darkness here. There's a, there's a caution to this, though, because if you look at someone else feeling an emotion and you say, I would be feeling this emotion this way if I was them, you better be sure that you've got enough data points or enough information about other people to be accurate or be authentic, authentic in your re-representation of someone else's emotions. If you haven't been, so this is why way back at the beginning of the podcast, we talked about maybe immature FI or uh, immature authenticity growing up and improving itself. If it's not mature, you may look at someone else, and I've had this happen in my life, and I'm guessing if you're an INFP listening, you've had this happen, where you've looked at somebody and you said, if I was them, I'd be feeling this emotion. And that's not what they're feeling at all. But because it's so subjective to you and you've projected yourself over to that person, you may make decisions based on someone else or based on the way you're going to interact with them on what you think they're going to feel not what they're actually feeling. And you might be fundamentally wrong about that. So this is a caution for you to say, I need to be inputting a lot. I need to be understanding more and more of a bigger frame of how the world works and how people work. So I don't synthetically project what I would be feeling in the situation onto them because that will that will throw off my mechanism of being able to interact with somebody in a real authentic way. Does that make sense? Absolutely. That's why the co-pilot process of exploration is so important to develop for an INFP. Exploration is how you collect more data and information. That's how you pattern recognize. I talked about it before as like seeing tells. That's when you get better and better at it. That's when you get more sophisticated. Sometimes it's good to just ask. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like sometimes exploration is like seeing somebody is getting evoked by a situation and going, hey, are you feeling blah, 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 blah? And then having them respond with, actually, I'm feeling this way and this way, or I'm not sure how I'm feeling. And then, you know, together maybe figuring it out through, you know, exploring the other person's emotional state. But sometimes it's just information gathering and the bigger a world you can see and the more you can interact, the more people you can interact with and more people you can act, interact with in more contexts then you get better and better at not just, like you said, projecting your emotional experience on somebody else, but actually getting really good at understanding that pattern recognition, getting really good at those tells. I think one thing, you know, you mentioned the darker aspects. I think one of the reasons why authenticity, you mentioned way earlier in the podcast about intent, and that one of the ways that I... INFPs might feel marginalized is they might think that people believe that they have ill intent or bad intent, especially when they're trying to say, hey, I feel this really strongly and I don't know why I feel it, but I do. I mean, let's take a really, I don't know, just like a really simple explanation or uh, uh, example. You know, like, I don't want to go to that restaurant. You've got a group of people, everybody wants to go to that restaurant, and the INFP is the only person who doesn't want to go. And maybe they feel really strongly about it for some reason. And They just, they can't explain why they feel the way they do. They just feel it really strongly. And the entire group of people are like, well, why can't you just get on board and just go to the place that all of us want to go? Now, most of the time, the INFP will, okay? I've noticed most, like 99.9% of the time, the INFP couldn't give two craps about where they go to eat necessarily. And then for some reason, this is the one time they care, right? They care because they had their heart set on something else or they don't like the food choices or they've changed their diet and they're now say vegan and it's very important for them to represent that or whatever it is. And the whole group of people might look at them and go, why are you insisting on this? And the INFP might not have a good reason that they can articulate, but they have, but they are just, they just feel so frustrated that people think they have ill intent. Like they're just being self-serving. Well, what, what actually will happen in that situation is they'll try to give a good reason, a good logical reason and it may not be even fully authentic to them, but they're trying to give people a reason because that's what people want from them. And it's not completely accurate. It's not completely authentic of the reason why. They just know in their heart it doesn't feel right to go to this restaurant maybe. So they try to give a reason. And then that reason is combated through logic <laughs> to show its illogicalness, if that's a word, illogicalness. And then they're frustrated even more because now they say, see, you don't have a reason. We just proved to you you don't have a reason because we just... We just downed the reason you gave us. We just completely made it irrelevant and we invalidated it. So now what's your real reason? Come on. And now the INFP is stuck again to just, they look like a stubborn person, I guess. Yeah. And 
I think I think one of the reasons why intent becomes really important in a context like this, like I, I don't have bad intent. I'm not necessarily just being self-serving. I'm not being self-centered. I can't give you a reason, but I feel it strongly. Again, 99.9% of the time, INFPs are so laid back. They couldn't give two craps about where they go. But for some reason, this is the one time they do. And I think, I think what ends up happening in a situation like this well, well, first of all, uh, I've had extremely dear friends who are INFPs, and I learned over time to go ahead and give them that one because they, they've they been so giving on all the other times. <laughs> it's like every, like for the last 10 times I got to choose a restaurant, and this is the one time you want to. So yeah, I mean, of course, let's go to where you want to go. That said, I think one of the reasons why in a moment like that, it oftentimes comes down to them defending their intent is because authenticity sees such a cavalcade of emotions inside of them, they do see the darkness inside. They do see where they have bad intent. They understand that all humans are both good and bad, negative, positive, you know, ill-intended, good intended. And because they can see that whole array of positive and negative intents, it's really important for them to establish that this is not one of the times that they have bad intent, which is really fascinating for somebody like me who doesn't even, I mean, I very rarely think in terms of intent at all. When I'm talking to an NFP, an authenticity person, actually any authenticity person, but in particular an INFP, when they are arguing that they have good intent here, I I almost have to go, "Well, well, of course you have good intent. What do you mean? Like, why would, why would this conversation come down to the intent level? And it's because I don't think in terms of intent, but they do. And that becomes very important. It becomes very important that they not be marginalized, invalidated, or seen as a bad person because they understand how easily a person can go to bad intent or how they can go to the negative. And so that's a a part of that dark side I think you mentioned, that dark side that authenticity can see how like, they see how we can really as humans slip into a very dark space. That's something that they have a connection to. I'm going to go out on a limb here, and if you're if you're INFP and you're listening, give me feedback. Let me know if this resonates. I would go out on a limb to say it's not just that they can see where humans can go dark. It's that their heart, remember, as an authenticity person, your heart is mapped to the degree where you see every possible nuance of emotion and motivation at the core level of your identity. That you not only can see where this can go, but you see it go there in yourself very viscerally like it's a visceral experience of seeing the darkness pop up the the negative thoughts and emotions about people the just really dark spot spots of your heart come up in a very visceral and experiential way it almost freaks you out as an authenticity authenticity person and you're like wow i i see how i hate to use the word good or bad because I, I don't know if I believe in good or bad in like a su- objective frame. But let me just use it for the sake of what I'm trying to say here. That you see in your heart how bad your heart could go if you allowed it to. Like how, you know, if the word evil actually existed, which I don't believe it does. But how evil and dark your heart could go. How, how bad it could be. You actually ex- not just see how it could potentially go there. But you actually see it go there sometimes in the way you think and feel. That you're like, whoa, this is this frightens even me, and I bet other people experience this too. And so this idea of intent comes in because you want to showcase the good intent in your life. Because you have a good intent part of you as well. All of us do. We have a good intent and bad intent part of us. And you, as an INFP, I would guess, have such a nuanced understanding of this that intent becomes important because you realize how dark the heart can go because you've felt it, you've experienced it. It's a visceral representation deep inside there. As an, as an ENFP, someone that does not lead with authenticity, I have some of this. I can imagine it would be even more so for someone that, that leads with this process. Yeah. I, on a sort of on a meta level, one of, the most, one of the more healthy INFPs that I know has, I, I didn't even realize that this was his way of coming to terms with it until later on I put all these pieces together. His perspective is that everything is positive intent fundamentally, even the dark parts of us, our attempts for love, our attempts to get needs met, it actually is all positive intent. But in that moment, you know, before you've gotten to a place where you can understand that even the darkest parts of you have positive intent, 
it it can feel really dark. And I think that's one of the reasons why INFPs can feel marginalized if they think people believe that they have ill intent. And that's one of the reasons why it's very important for them to, you know, to make sure that other people know that they have positive intent. I think that stems from this, what comes from this understanding about yourself and the darkness, the potential darkness of your heart, or even the seeing some of those darkness parts pop out, quote unquote darkness, we'll just put those in quotes. Because again, like you said, there's this argument that everything's positive intent. There's a lot of self-doubt that comes with this. There's this idea that, am I good enough? Am I okay? And more than other types, I would say the INFP, there's a few other types that have this as well, but there's this idea of maybe self-punishment or, uh, you know, self-bludgeoning, at least metaphorically, and sometimes physically. You know, oftentimes there's, there's even this part of physically harming yourself because you feel, you can see some of the, especially society would classify as bad, dark parts of you. Even if you don't necessarily, as a, at a personal level, you realize that if other people saw this part of you, they would not be happy with it. And so there's this idea of self-doubt, self-abuse, you know, maybe hurting yourself either emotionally or physically, and self-punishment, like, I don't deserve this. I need to be, quote unquote, punished, or I deserve bad things because I know I've got some darkness in me. And you're so closely tied with that. You can feel, and, and then if, you know, religion or society amps up this on top of that, you can feel really bad really quickly. And I think that's where some of the self-doubt and self-harm and self-punishment can come from for an INFP specifically. Well, and probably just a release on how intense they're feeling emotions. Like yeah. you said, like all these other societal factors might come in and amp up the feeling as opposed to just looking at the feeling going, okay, well, this is how I'm feeling. Like there are dark parts of the human experience and there's light parts of the exp human experience. And I just happen to feel, be feeling one of the dark parts. Like you said, we could get all these you know, messages that it's not acceptable. It's not okay to feel them. So instead of experiencing them and then going, oh, okay, so I'm going to hold space for the darkness. I'm going to hold space for what's going on right now. I'm going to allow myself to just feel it. I'm not going to act on it. I'm just going to let it, let myself feel it, let it go to the intensity it needs to, and then go to the next emotion. There's a sense that you're not allowed to experience that darkness. And so you stop it and it gets put into a loop. And now there's no way to, now there's no way to, get relief from it, right? Because uh, we, we mentioned in a previous podcast, actually, it was an INFP that taught me this, that they read that intense emotions when, you know, let's put a emotional feeling on a scale of, you know, one to 10. If you can allow an intense emotion to get as close to 10 as it authentically wants to get to, it takes about eight minutes for the intensity to go away. But if you stop it anywhere up to, let's say it wants to go to 10, if you stop it at six or seven, because it's wrong to feel that, you know, that feeling, or I just can't handle the intensity of it, then it gets caught in a loop and it won't go away. Sometimes it'll not feel as strong, but it'll always be there. I think sometimes that, you know, sort of that maybe cutting or some of the other forms of self-punishment, physical self-punishment that authenticity people can do, it's because they don't give themselves permission to go all the way to 10. They don't give themselves permission to go all the way to the, you know, to the, true intensity of that feeling and then let it cycle through because they think that that's wrong somehow like you said with societal messages and i think that's a lot of times why they you know they'll just do they'll, they'll be physically punishing on themselves just to get some relief from those strong emotions and i i think that's completely understandable and at the same time it it seems like if you just go ahead and hold space for those emotions and just go, this is part of the human experience, right? And I just happen to be more in touch with it than other people are. So I'm going to let myself go to 10, right? And it'll take about eight minutes and it'll be done. <laughs> you know, that might not be a bad thing. I think one of the other pieces of this idea of self-punishment or self-abuse or feeling the feelings that may be the precursors to that, even if you don't actually go through with any kind of you know, so, and self-punishment could be even just emotional punishment. I think what happens for authenticity is that because we can see the deep emotions of ourselves, we see the bad, like we've talked about, that if we can see the bad in our hearts and we perceive that other people don't see bad in their hearts, like they don't see the bad and we're the only ones that do, we almost feel like we're the only people on the planet that must be bad or wrong or can see these dark parts. That must mean that we're bad wrong and dark and other people aren't and that's that really feels like you have to 
you almost have to punish yourself because you're so bad, you're so wrong for being who you are when other people just aren't as introspective to see that about themselves. It's this thing about being able to see the darkness that your heart can go to. And I think that's where a lot of this punishment or feeling in, uh, feeling in, inferior, feeling like not good enough can come from for an authenticity person. Yeah, I could see getting caught in that loop. Once again, though, it's a matter of being able to see outside of yourself using the exploration co-pilot process of pattern recognition and recognizing that it really is a matter of the more personal something is, the more universal it is. So feeling the need to, you know, self-harm in order to rectify how you must be this terrible person in this sea of not quite as terrible people being able to understand that this darkness, regardless of whether or not other people are seeing it within themselves, that this darkness is universal. Other people have the capacity as well. They might not be able to recognize it, but it's still there. And that's just part of the human experience. So one thing I want to mention before we're, you know, done talking about the INFP personality type and some, I mean, we're, we're really talking about some things that maybe other, other profiles don't really talk about. Right, because we're getting into we're getting into ways that this manifests some components of how they really how they really experience being INFPs, not in a conceptual level, but what what our observation has been is you know, some of the real struggles that they have, and also some of the real amazing things that they bring to the world. One of the things I wanted to address before we we're done is I, I hesitate to use the word business, but career how to go about making a living as an INFP. We've been talking about that authenticity process. And if you are spending a lot of your time and attention experiencing what's going on with you internally, how you're feeling, that's time and attention you are not spending on how to get something done in the outside world in the most efficient way possible. <laughs> so authenticity and effectiveness, that that decision-making process of effectiveness, they're sort of mirror opposites of each other. Think of them as two sides of the same coin. And so getting something done in the outside world, making things happen in the outside world, getting goals accomplished can sometimes be the biggest thorn in an INFP side. Like, how do I get my dreams accomplished? So I think we should spend a couple minutes at least talking about INFPs and how they interact with the outside world, right? Making a living, entering into business, getting big things accomplished. How does an INFP go about that? One of the things that I think about the INFP and we, we mentioned this in one of the videos we shot for the YouTube channel, is there is this desire to, to, to make an impact, to be an ins at least an inspirational leader. And oftentimes they understand that because they understand people so well, they would make great leaders, but oftentimes making that a reality is difficult. Be just like for the reasons you said, if you're spending so much time internally, it's hard to make something externally happen. But there's this desire for that still. There's this aspiration for something externally, some kind of an impact in the world to be made. And often I think it can be frustrating because you know, you're going through life, you want to build that business or have that coaching practice and you just don't know what to do. You don't know how to go about or take on that career that you know is going to require so much of you. Uh, and one of the things that I see some INFPs doing that will, will shortcut this is it goes back to the authenticity process is they will disregard the thing they're passionate about to pursue something they think they should be doing in the external world that will be quote unquote successful for them. And so really the first thing that I think you and I would tell the INFP listening, if you're listening to us, is that idea of following your passion, which any type will benefit from, but in particular you, because you are going to make up for any lack of ability to manifest something in the outside world through an intense, immersive passion you'll bring to any project or activity or business or career you do. Because you'll just, you know, you like uh, Will Smith talks about dying on the treadmill. Like He's like, I'll just outwork anybody on the planet. I don't care who they are. I will outwork them to get done what I want to get done. And as an INFP, you kind of have that same thing. If you are passionate about something, you will move heaven and earth and everything else in your path to pursue that passion. And so the idea of doing something that is so passionate for you or something that's so on mission for you or something that has purpose in your heart is so important because it will 
it will make up for anything else that you are still learning through. Any other external things of like to-do lists and activities and prioritizations and anything like that, that passion can make up for so much. So passion is extremely important. Yeah, the logistics are always going to be your Achilles heel. They just are. Yeah, like that's the def- that's just your that's your plight in life. <laughs> that's your plight in life. All of us have one. All of us, as a specific personality types, have something that's going to just bite us in the ass. And for you, it's going to be logistical efficiency, <laughs> like like setting up systems around you that work so seamlessly that they never need your personal input. Right? Like you're not going to do that. So. To make up for being able to set up these seamless systems, right, that just work around you, being in full alignment, when you make a decision, we keep we keep talking about it as what quote unquote feels right. Another way that we could describe it is every part of you in, that's inside of you, because there are lots of parts inside of us. Nobody knows that better than an authenticity person, but there's lots of different parts inside of us. And when we want to do something, there's always inner dialogue. Should I do it? Should I not do it? Here's the pros and cons. You know, this part of me says yes. This part of me says no. And what authenticity does is it waits for that moment or it it does enough introspection and enough thinking and enough going inside themselves to parse out a decision that has all, if, if not all, most of those inner voices in alignment. They're all in agreement. All the par- parts inside of you go, yes, that's the thing that you need to do. And so, first of all, that's time consuming, right? That takes that takes time. I, I've noticed that authenticity people sometimes don't know the right decision to make until after they've made it because they didn't like none of there are parts of them that weren't sure how it would go down. And so they actually needed to experience the decision in order to go, yes, that was the right call or no, that was the wrong decision to make. So authenticity makes decisions based on all those parts being in alignment with each other. Like just think of like a, a, you know, just a line that goes straight through the core of your body and all your parts are like centered in alignment. That's how you know when it's a right decision to make. When you are trying to navigate the world of making a living, anytime you're doing something that doesn't have all of those parts of you in chorus saying, yes, this is absolutely what I want, you will always to some extent be half-assing it, right? You can't help it because there's a part of you that goes, let's just not do this. (laughs) And it's loud. (laughs) There's going to be a part. So if you've got a cubicle job and you're doing data entry for some other company that you couldn't give two craps whether or not it survives, you might be perfectly acceptable as a data entry clerk, but it's not going to be your passion. And there's going to be lots of you going, why am I wasting my time doing this? Why am I doing this? What am I doing? Which is going to kill your efficiency, right? Because you're paying attention to that voice. When you are doing something that is completely in alignment, completely, there is no mental or emotional attention allocated to the question of why am I doing this? Right. Like the energy that is being siphoned to the question why is now energy that you can reapply to the task at hand because you are totally in alignment with it. You are totally passionate about it. You are doing the thing that makes every part of you sing and you will work 10 times as hard for that. Even if you're not good at setting up systems, even if you're not good at the logistics, it doesn't matter. Like Joel quoted Will Smith, you will you will die on the treadmill to make that thing happen. The other thing that comes from this passion that you bring is passion, if you have true, authentic passion, it's magnetic. And so the second tip that we would suggest if you're looking to build a business, move your career forward, is to get help. And in order to get help, oftentimes the best way to do that is to attract it through magnetism, through your passionate magnetism toward whatever it is that you want to do. Now, not always the case. Sometimes you actually literally have to go out and ask somebody, hey, can you support me in this? Or can I build something or get somebody to help in a simpatico way to build the thing I'm passionate about because they can't see your passion yet. You haven't maybe matured it enough to where it is just drawing people to you. But I've noticed that the INFPs who have been world changers, the ones who've really made a difference, have usually had someone they've attracted or a group of people they've attracted that have supported their vision because that passion, and then if you can articulate it through an experiential emotion experience or a vision for something, People rally behind that. They get excited about it. And man, now you've got a support structure to help make those things a reality. 
I would definitely use people like Richard Branson as an example of an INFP that's a self-made millionaire. He's He did what he was passionate about from the very beginning, and he mobilized people around him, and he was able to make one of the biggest companies in the world through his passion. It's very important as an authenticity person, one of the things that I've seen trip up authenticity people when they are leading, right, or they're mobilizing groups, is it's hard to remember to, first of all, to get input, right? Because if you've got the mission, if you've got the vision in front of you, you want everybody to be, they're basically supporting your art, right? Like your mission is your art and you want to be in control of your art, right? Like, because it's very important how other people are impacted by your art. So whenever you're on mission, right, whatever that looks like, whether it is actually, you know, literally artwork or whether or not it's building a business or whether or not it's leading or starting a nonprofit or whether, whatever it is, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's a religion. It doesn't matter. Regardless of what it is, one of the things that authenticity people can do is have a tendency to, weirdly enough, marginalize the people around them. So it's very important to make sure that you understand that these people are your secret weapons. All right. I don't know an INFP that's done it on their own. I don't know anybody who's really done it on their own. But I don't know an INFP that has really gotten to the like really, really, really high levels of proficiency in any field without having at least one, if not a group of people as their secret weapons. So it's very important to remember to treat those people extremely well. Pay them as high as you can pay them. <laughs> Get inputs. Make sure, you know, check in with them frequently. Make sure that they feel good about what's going on. That's your normal state anyways, an authenticity person. So just don't lose track of that or don't lose touch of, you know, with that piece when you're working with a team. But that's what I would say. I would say pursue your passion in a way that like Julie Cameron talks about in The Artist Way. Uh, she talks about the difference between pursuing your passion and pursuing something that's a joy, like um, on the... A sh- I think she calls it a shadow artist passion shadow or something. Art, right, exactly. Like kind of adjoining the passion, but not exactly it. Like the shadow artist, like if you really want to be producing film, you become like... I don't know, like a best boy or a grip, <laughs> right? I mean, that's that could be argued as climbing up the lines or climbing up the um, the levels. But it's it's not doing something that's kind of related to your passion, but not exactly your passion, because maybe some part of you fears doing your, your mission or some part of you fears you won't actually succeed. So you do something close to it, but not exactly it. That's the greatest way to keep yourself impoverished. Make sure you're doing exactly what your passion is and just don't let anybody get in your way, right? And even if you have to be a starving artist for a long time, just keep going that direction. And then on top of that, get your secret weapon. Get your person, right, of a different personality type than you, of a very different personality type from you, really. STJs are some of the best. I would say and all the INFPs that I know that have had secret weapons, they've all been ISTJs or ISFJs. But that said, you get your secret weapons, of people of different personality types, you treat them extremely well, right? You check in with them, make sure that they feel really good. And as a team, build your major mission and passion. Now that's all very ethereal. There's not, you know, you know, step one, step two, step three, that's for a different podcast. But for this particular podcast, I would say that that's, you know, just really keep checking in internally with yourself. What is that number one passion? That's the first thing you got to do as an INFP is figure out what your number one, no question, not a shadow art, you know, artistic pursuit, absolutely to the center of your being. Every part of you sings when it thinks about this particular thing. This has been a tough podcast for us. We, we spent a lot of time pre talking before we started recording and really thinking through this because we understand that as an INFP listening, if you're listening, everything is so personal and subjective to you that you're going to find that, well, that doesn't exactly describe me. And so we were, we were hoping that we could get enough here, that you have something to work with, and you're going to take your own pattern recognition and your own intuition and your own understanding, your own heart condition, your own inner alignment, and you're going to take what we've said, and you're going to find the parts that work for you or that resonate with you, that feel authentic to you. And... This is a discussion starter. We want to continue the conversation beyond just this podcast. And we understand that, especially as an INFP listening, there's no way, especially like an hour podcast, we've actually gone a little longer than a normal podcast because there's so much intricacy to this personality type. There's no way we can accurately or authentically describe every part of you because every every INFP is going to be fundamentally different in how they see themselves subjectively and nuanced. But we hope there's enough in here that you can take it and build upon it and we can create a great discussion in the community 
around what it means to be an INFP, about what it means for you to be an INFP and where you're at in your growth and where you can help others and others can help you and we can build a community together of people trying to help each other in this personal development journey that we're all on together. I mean, Antonia and I are a part of this journey with you and we're excited to have you a part of this with us. This is a community we're building, a discussion starter. And I just wanted to say that kind of as a, as an encapsulation of everything we've talked about today because you know this, this has been a, a podcast that we know is needed and we wanted to spend some time to really try to get it right as much as we could and get it as authentic as we could because we feel like it could really be a powerful discussion starter. So I just want to say that kind of in a, a closing remarks, I guess. So thank you very much for being on this podcast with us. As Joel mentioned, please feel free to leave comments, leave your subjective experience as a comment. It maybe share some components to what you think is common for your type that you've observed that you would really love for people to know about you. And look us up on Facebook. We're at facebook.com forward slash personality hacker. We've got a great community over there. So please come join the discussion there. Or you can leave a comment under this podcast on our website. You can also find us at Twitter, uh, Twitter dot com forward slash personality hack. And we would love, 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 love if you would be willing to rate us on iTunes. We'd love to hear your ratings and reviews and also give us ideas for future podcasts. Yeah, we're excited that you're part of this community and we want to see you on the next podcast. Don't forget to go to personalityhacker.com and come over and join the discussion. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. We'll talk to you on the next podcast. <laughs>